This week, take a deep dive into culture. What does it mean to you, and what does being culturally aware actually translate into? With Rhys Paddock, creator of Aboriginal Awareness Programs. Rhys shares how he began his work by returning to his own school as an Aboriginal Educational Officer, and how this led to where he is today. After challenging what culture actually means, Rhys goes on to move the discussion to answer the so what question of how cultural awareness can be applied and how he's developing a specific program with this aim. Rhys talks about how Aboriginal people walk between two worlds and he invites you to do the same. There is a wealth of knowledge and insight into Aboriginal culture and way of life and thinking that comes from this very free-flowing and engaging conversation. So enjoy, Rhys. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Aboriginal education and cultural awareness are some of the topics we're going to deep dive into today with my guest, Rhys Paddock. Rhys, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Good to have you here. So, you were born and raised in Perth. Yes. 25 years in Balladura. Mm. Tell me, what was it like growing up? <laughs> I had... I mean, it was an interesting childhood. Um, in what way? Balladura, Balladura is always... It was always seen as, you know, a bit of a ghetto, you know, like you had, you got, you had North Balladura, you had South Balladura and, you know, North, South Balladura is the real ghetto and I was in the North part, so I was in like the fancy part of Balladura. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, but for me and, and within my family dynamics and, you know, the people that I surrounded myself with, we were, we were always pretty solid. Um, but it was, you know, we had a good school, uh, went to a good primary school there, um, and I went to the, to the high school in Balladura as well. So, you know, a good solid 95% of my life just revolved around that suburb because I just, everything, all, all mm. my whole life was there. My friends were there, my family was there and, and my schools were there and everything. So it was kind of a, um, that was just sort of where I grew up and where I lived yeah. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was, yeah, it was good. I, I still love the place. I still go there. My parents still live there, you know, so it's still my home. I still consider it my home. Yeah. You know, yeah. What's, uh, what were some of your fondest memories of growing up? Of, oh, man. Of just being in Western Australia. This is a question I ask all my guests. Yeah. You know, I moved here eight, nearly nine years ago. Yeah. So, uh, and it's called WA Real, so I always like to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like WA specific or yeah, what was it like growing up? I mean, oh, that's a good question. Fondest memories. I really, despite most people, most people's view on high school, I really enjoyed high school as a kid. I really, I actually really liked it, um, and it wasn't because of the academic side of things because I I don't I don't really consider myself too much of a a, a smart person. Um, you know, I was kind of the, the B grade, C grade student in most subjects, but so what I solid, yeah. So, you know, I was passing and I was doing well, but it wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't enjoy doing maths, you know, I didn't yeah. enjoy doing, but what I did enjoy, especially about high school was, so my fondest memories is, was just being sort of like, you know, growing up and, um, growing up with my friends, growing up with my boys, um, you know, meeting my first partner and, um, just developing like a solid social network within the school um mm. i'm trying to think of specific stories but really when i look back on like high school days it's just it was just a good experience i just i look at the overall thing i'm like you know it was, it was all right it was good fun i enjoyed i enjoyed most of it not year seven though year seven was the worst i hated year seven year seven was the absolute antithesis of what i'm talking about because it was First that year. transitional stage yeah. from year six and you know you have it's one sort of culture that you have in primary school and then you get to high school and you realize, oh shit, like this is a whole nother, this is, and then you, you go through all that identity crisis and, you know, I didn't know what I was supposed to be wearing. So I'd overcompensate and I'd wear like, you know, bucket hats and stuff like that. <laughs> and, um, I didn't know how to do my hair and it was, it was a very confusing time as I'm, uh, as it would be for, for, for many, you know, 12, 13 year old prepubescent boys. But <laughs> we, you, your question was, what was my fondest memories? And, um, anything but year seven was probably my fondest right. memories. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So you've had numerous roles that focus on Aboriginal education yeah. and awareness. Yeah. Where does the drive for that come from in your story? I mean, where does the drive come from? That is a good question. Um, I enjoy... I really like culture. I like language. And I like... And I'm not talking just Aboriginal culture. I like, I like to... I like looking at different 
peoples and different groups and I like seeing how people operate within their families and I've, I've sort of come to realize that there's just so many layers upon layers upon layers of culture right you know there's yeah. You can say that there's Australian culture, you know, which is, uh, you know, there's a certain way that people look at Australian culture if you're not in Australia. And then there's certain ways of Australian people looking at Australian culture. And, you know, then you've got sort of subcategories of that culture. You know, you've got, you've got your work culture. So there's specific standards and cultural standards that you um, abide by in a work context. And, you know, yeah. you, you won't do certain things and there's certain rules you've got to play by. And then you've got different cultures like you got sort of like, you know, um, a culture like um, when you're talking to, when, when you're around children or talking to kids, you know, and it's like, don't swear, don't say the F word. Or you, if they're really young, you know, you speak to them differently. So I like, I like the idea of how people interact and how yeah. people socialize. And that really interests me. When did that first switch on? For probably, you? probably this one, the cultural aspect somewhat recently, somewhat right. recently. It wasn't like I was very interested. I was, I've always liked people, but in terms of, now understanding what culture is, that one, that sort of has become sort of my new fascination. Um, but working in the Aboriginal education space, that was almost kind of by accident. That was sort of, I sort of, um, I guess, um, flowed into that. And the reason why was because originally, originally I pursued um, um, acting. So I did a certificate for in Aboriginal theatre, and that was at WAPA. So that was at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts. And, um, like most kids after high school, I was like, you know, what, uh, what, I don't really know what I want to do, but I know that I really enjoy acting and singing and dancing and performing. I like being on stage. So yeah. I went and pursued that for a bit, but what it ended up um, happening, that was a one year course. And then from that, after that course, um, that industry is, is a very difficult industry to, to, to get into. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of at the point where I was like, okay, I'm after, it's after 2007 now. It's after 2008, sorry. I've got my cert for, um, you know, I got some jobs with Yuri Arkin, and Yuri Arkin's like an Aboriginal um, acting organization. They right. do shows and things and on and off. And at this, but at this point, um, my old principal from Balladura Community College, um, his name is Stefan Silcox at the time, um, he approached me and he was like, look, we need a new AIEO, which is an Aboriginal and Islander education officer at the school. Um, the school you, you at the school from. that I came from. Wow! And he was like, "Yeah, did, you know, because we, we, him and I had a really good rapport, and he was a very good mentor and role model to me, mm. and I had a very good relationship with him. So his his thought was his thought process was, let me approach Reese because he's young, um, he's indigenous, um, he was head boy at the school, you know. So I, I had some reputation, and people yeah. knew who I was, and he said." do you want to at least trial this position? Because, and at that time, again, because I was sort of doing the acting thing as well, I was like, well, this is a good, this will get me some money and sort of yeah. things like that. You know, so I need to eat. Um, so then I sort of trained, then I sort of was trained up to, to that role, which then I guess was the first stepping stone into Aboriginal education because my role was to look after year sevens to twelves and uh, or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids, students, and um, it gets to support them in their education. So that yeah. could be, you know, um, helping one of, one of the kids with some homework or it could be liaising with the parents. And this is me now developing my network of working with students and working within Aboriginal education. Yeah. So that was kind of how I stepped into that role. And then I realized I was actually kind of utilizing a lot of my skills that I had learned from Aboriginal theatre because you... What sort you, of skills were that? Well, it's... well. Some things like, um, especially like my presenting skills. So I was yeah. asked to come into the classrooms and, um, you know, whether it was to, to, to read Dreamtime stories to the year sevens or it was always sort of like, you know, at the assembly or something um, and get up and do an acknowledgement of country or something. So a lot of the, my training, like just little elements of it, you know, like or how, how, what, how, how to place your breath and how to articulate your words and how to hold the room and presence. So, you know, a lot of that sort of... Um, came into play within yeah. that role and that was kind of so it kind of worked out pretty well and then I found that I kind of really just fell in love with the position not really the position it was just the kids and the students that I was working with and the community that surrounded them and seeing yeah. them grow I was like it's uh, I was like okay you know especially seeing a student from year seven and 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 um get to year eight get to year nine get to year ten you're following them on that whole journey it's it's quite re it's, so it's quite rewarding but it was weird though as well because i was in i was 18 at the time right yeah. so my year 12 students 
were a year younger than me. And yeah. I'm supposed to be that position of authority. Yeah. And not to mention that the staff, all the other staff at the school are still 15 to 20 years older than me as well. Yeah. So I was in this gray area because I wasn't yeah. a student, but I wasn't within the staff culture. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So I was really kind of by myself. So I, I was in a very interesting um, position, you know. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's right. That was, that's kind of, that was, so to answer your question, that was kind of the, the stepping stone to Aboriginal education yeah. at that point. When, um, has this been something that you've just continued on or has it been something where after a period of time in that job you suddenly thought, oh, th this is it, this is what I want to do? Something. When did the coin drop? Because it sounded like you sort of, I wouldn't say fell into it, but you sort of. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah it wasn't. It definitely where I am today is not something that I planned. It's not something yeah. that I pursued, and I'm like, this is the person that I want to be. And I kind of don't. I don't know if I really like that idea. Mm. Like one of the one of the things that I really didn't like was when kids were asked, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, and right, and the reason, and I get it, but I, the reason why I don't think it's a good idea is because kids, you know, people's people change all the time. So I mean, I wanted to be a scientist when I was like in second grade or something and I was like but I remember going the, the process of mm. thinking was like the reason why I wanted to be a scientist was because I thought the lab coats looked cool <laughs> and and I liked the idea that you could mix chemicals and burn things so that was my point of reference yeah so but my point is is that you know um, I never I've never really been like a long-term goal orientated person I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but that's just me so I just sort of uh, as long as I'm in a place which I enjoy and which yeah. and every step of every um, every step of my career, I've always made sure it's aligned with something that I enjoy doing. So I like doing that because I can still build on myself within that domain. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah, it is something that sort of happened by accident. It's not like after school I was like I want to work at the school at the same school and be yeah. an AIO at the school, and then in four years time I want to be a lawyer or whatever. No, I was just. This is in, this is the opportunity that's opened itself to me. This yes. is the door that's opened to me, and I like it. And I've got a good community here. And let's see what happens. Yeah. yeah. How much um, how much of a role did um, Aboriginal culture and tradition play in your childhood and while you were at school? Um, that's a good question too. Uh, there's probably a lot of different layers to this. In because they're the formative. Yeah, yeah, it's there's a lot to Aboriginal culture. So if you're talking mm. about like traditional Aboriginal culture, because people again, people have a, a an idea of what in bold letters Aboriginal culture is in their head. Oh, and what would that represent? Oh, uh, you know, it's like uh, Aboriginal people out in the bush. You know, got their didgeridoos and like you know they've got the the the, the right. face paint on. They're doing the corroborees. And, you know, um, that's like yeah, that's that would be like what somebody would think that isn't in Australia. You know, and that people that might think like. Uh, you know, a lot of even I've noticed a lot of people still outside of Australia still refer to Aboriginal people as Aborigines. You know, right? So it's just so to answer the question, it's like it's you got to think of it like how much did Aboriginal culture play a role in in my upbringing? Yes. Well, it's there's different layers and there's different areas of which. Um, so, for example, uh, my mother is uh, has four sisters and one brother, and they're sort of all. Um, you know, some are in Geraldton and Miningu where she grew up and some live around the corner in so Dutch, different, you know, different, different places, different yeah. areas. And, um, each, each of them have sort of different knowledge and different understandings and different, um, so, and a lot of them take, so some of my, my mum, you know, she says to me, you know, if you want to learn about, um, you know, Aboriginal, if you want to learn about your Yamaji culture and, and a lot of that stuff, you got to go talk to your uncle because he yeah. knows a lot more Yama, about that. Yamaji. Yamaji, yeah. Yeah. So, that Yam means so we are Noongar country here. Yes. So Noongar country is comprised of 14 different sub-clans of Noongar yeah. people. So specifically here in Fremantle, this would be Wadjuk country. Um, yeah. And then uh, um, surrounded by um, different clans, which make up the Noongar nation. And then you go up north and where Geraldton is and um, specifically where Miningu is, um, my mother's people are Yamaji or Baramaya Yamaji more specifically. So yeah. Baramaya people, um, Yamaji people. Um, so that's what my mum's saying, you know, she says, so in terms of like, if I need, if I would like to learn more about my traditional Yamaji, um, her, yeah, it would be, it would be sort of go, go talk to your uncle or, um, or, uh, cause he, he knows a lot more than saying my mother does, you yeah. know? Um, so really like 
the influence of Aboriginal culture for me growing up has been mostly Noongar based, even though traditionally I'm not a Noongar person, but because I'm living in Noongar country and because I'm work the students that I've worked with for the last 10 years have a majority have been Noongar. Yeah. I know a lot, I know Noongar language, I know Noongar, um, you know, dream time story, um, the, the history, the culture, like I know mm. a lot more Noongar stuff than say I do, um, Yamaji stuff, just mm. simply because I'm surrounded by Noongars all the time and also because our families are married into Noongar families and as, as well. So my, you know, my, say for example, um, you know, my mother's sister's, um, partner is um, a Noongar man, and so his his um, my cousins, you know, they're, yeah. they're Noongars and they're Yamajis, you know. So I know a lot more Noongar stuff than I say would um, Yamaji yeah. stuff, you know. Not to mention the language as well. So Baramaya language, Noongar language is spoken, like some like a lot of people speak it. It's now being integrated and taught in schools, which I think is a really good thing. Yeah. And but you go to where um, so you go to Baramaya uh, Baramaya language. From my understanding and the research that I've done. I think there's only maybe three or four people that speak that specific language. And one of those people, um, one of those elders spent the last 15 years or so developing a dictionary. Um, and they've released this dictionary, but this dictionary is really hard to find. Like, I've, I've, you know, you click on the link on that one website. It's like, click here to buy the dictionary. And that's broken. So, you know, you call them up and you email them and... It's, it's getting harder to find that dictionary, but I'm, I'm going to get that You're dictionary because I want to revive a bit of that language, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, to, I guess, the influence of, of yeah. Aboriginal and what did culture. That, sorry, if you don't mind. No, yeah. What did that influence sort of look and feel like on a... Um, what do you mean? On a, like a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Mm, do you mean like like growing up or working yeah. or... Growing up, working. Um, I was surrounded... I would say that most of my childhood um, growing up would have, that would probably have been the most minimal, um, we'll say, uh, culturally influenced right. period of my life. Um, it, it was only sort of since I started working within the domain of Aboriginal education was I exposed more and more and more to understanding Aboriginal culture and, right. um, you know, uh, language and history and customs and all that kind of thing so not too much growing up okay. um a lot more when i started working yeah yeah so give me an idea of um what's the sort of work that you do nowadays so now you know i, I get up in the morning and i ask myself that question <laughs> i got i've got a few different things going on at the moment i'm very used to being with the, with the last 10 years of my career I've been very used to a very specific and yeah. understood role. Because you went from the school to being a program manager. That's and it. And now it's now there's a few different things. So um, yeah. it's um, so at the moment. So I've kind of I've kind of gone from working with high school students to then working with um, well high school students again, but also university students. And now I'm actually kind of working with um, business leaders. And mm. well, it depends what you look at it because. <laughs> I'll start. I'll, I'll 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 back up a little bit. One of the jobs that I have right now is working in Mundaring for a program called Nearer to Nature, um, and this program is uh, I'm I, I'm the facilitator for their cultural programs there, and this mm. is just a part time role, um, and this is something that uh, they bring primary school students um, to Mundaring, and you know I just uh, there's uh, might be a few hours out of the day where I might um, take them on a hunt. Not an actual hunt, but we'll go out and I'll show them the bushlands there and we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, traditional names of things and bush tucker and, or it might be, you know, do some face painting, dot paintings, just real simple stuff. Funny enough, this is the first time I've actually worked with primary school students. So that's another interesting thing. Yeah. That's one thing that I'm doing. Uh, so that keeps me involved within the, still within the um, education yes. role of things. Um, uh, another thing that I'm doing is working with um, my business partner slash boss, um, Suzanne, who you've had on the program before. And what Suzanne does is she is a behavioral change facilitator and she, um, you know, she, she goes out and does the, the keynote speaking and the workshops and the coaching. Um, and what I like about this is I, I like the idea that I can still, I can design my own content. So we're, we're, we're designing our own program, um, which is called Cultural Curiosity. Cool. And, and what's col- the outcome you're chasing with the, that? The outcome is I like, I like the idea of introducing, um, 
the idea that I'd like to give out um, what I know and understand from Aboriginal culture, mm. and I want to present it to Australian people so that they can adopt it as their own culture. And the reason I say, and the reason I word it like this is very mm. specific because what I find, and I've worked within, I've worked for, you know, I've done content and program delivery for, and I'm using air quotes here. Yeah. For those just listening, cultural awareness. And yeah. cultural awareness is very important. I think it's got its place today because no, not many people are culturally aware. But I like the idea that people can become aware, but once you're aware, what are you going to do with your well, awareness? So I like the idea of calling this sort of a cultural application. Yeah. Um, so I like the idea. Now, so when I say, and a lot of people sort of think when they get that cultural awareness, they go, oh, I'm, I'm now more aware of Aboriginal culture, yeah. right? Cool. Which is good, which what, is good, yeah. but I think well, what we're going to do. What I like, what I, what I, what I like, um, the idea being is that I like the idea of saying that um, it's not just Aboriginal culture; it's it's Australian culture, it's your yeah. culture, it's world culture. It's it's just mm. a specific point of view from people that live in Australia as well. I don't like the idea of it being like, oh, that's their culture and this is our culture, and now I know more about their culture. So yes. what does that make me? I like yeah. the idea, however, of going... Very separate. Yeah. <laughs> I really like the idea of going, look at Aboriginal culture and what you can take away from Aboriginal culture is sort of inherent to a lot of world culture, you know, mm. especially with relationships and community um, and language and, and, and um, you know, camaraderie, you know. Um, a lot of that is inherent within all cultures. Mm. But again, a lot of people just think of it like, oh, that's just Aboriginal culture. Oh yeah, they got they got um you know the the word got that for thing going on. Uh, yeah they, we're on um we're on that Wajak country yeah I know that because I did that cultural awareness and I'm aware now like that's good that's a good step but it, what I like to do is take that and be like this is your culture too hmm. you know because you live here because you live here you know and and that's sort of just more of a harmonious way to look at things I think. Hmm. So, and plus, to be honest, again, there's a little bit of my actor side coming out. I just kind of like being in front of people and talking. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, it, it, it makes me feel good and it's just funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. It's it's kind of, um, that's kind of what I'm doing at yeah, the moment. Yeah, because it, um, you know, I became very aware not so long ago that um, I've been living in WA for eight years. I am actually a dual citizen, so I'm English and Australian. Yeah. Uh, but then after a period of time, I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, there's a whole bit to this country that I've just completely overlooked, yet I've still got a passport. Yeah. And, and then it's kind of, you know, here I am, uh, a white fellow from England. How, how do I, A, become more aware? And then, you know, probably because of my own bent and curiosity, you know, that's why I do the podcast. Yeah. Um, I, li I like to learn. Yeah. And I like to learn about what different people are up to, uh, how they view the world, how they interact with one another. Um, you know, I've spent time in South America and that was almost like looking into world history there. Yeah. You know, you can see what, um, you, see, you know, you can see what the, the invasion there did in terms of the conquistadors and stuff, but you can still see this ancient, ancient um, yeah. history and, and, and culture. And... You know, I'm not so arrogant to think that modern day culture's got it all licked because it certainly doesn't. Because yeah. you just have to look at you know what we're doing to the planet, how many people are in prison, <laughs> what you read on the newspaper. Oh yeah, and, we, and we can go down 500 different rabbit holes there. We, we can, yeah. <laughs> we can indeed. So there's part of me out of a respect for the place that I live, mm. but b my own. You know, I'm not Personal. finished artic article. I, you know, it's constantly I can be learning, 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 yeah. learning, and there just seems to be a rich vein of old, 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 ancient knowledge yeah. that just doesn't. Uh, well, I'm going to say it doesn't get tapped into. All I'm going to say, I'm going to keep it personal to myself. Is I don't know how to go and find out. Yeah, yeah, and it, and, it, and it's tricky. It's frustrating because <laughs> yeah. like you say, oh, so we do a cultural awareness, like. What are some of the key things that you, you cover in cultural awareness? You know, you don't have to go through the whole yeah. topic. What are some of the key things that you 
if it's a, if you're talking like a general cultural yeah, yeah, awareness, yeah. Uh, like a 101, like a crash yeah, course, yeah. I mean, it'll be you. You'll go through a bit of history. You go through sort of like that pre the pre colonizational history. You go through the post colonizational history. You go through a little bit about language. You go through a little bit about uh, morals and values. Probably back a little bit about kinship systems as well, mm. and that'll just make your head hurt because there's no way you can really understand a kinship system within you know a three hour course of, uh, of uh, kinship of, meaning kinship uh, the the system like a skin you ever heard that word like the skin like a skin system or a skin group right in uh, again to give you a, um, an idea it'll be sort of like um, we have a specific way of our kinship system in terms of a non-aboriginal perspective is that of you know um, biological biologically you know my mother's uh, my my mother's other son is my brother and my mother's partner is my father and there's a there's a biological structure which i guess you could yeah. call a kinship system right yeah so with aboriginal people yes it's it's similar it's same 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 but different so it's you know you'll you'll see that um with a lot of different mob there'll be somebody who calls this person an uncle but they're not biologically their yeah. uncle so that gets a bit confusing so non-aboriginal people look at that and they're like why is he your uncle? Or why are you calling this person your brother? But that's not your brother. because, Oh, you know? Or why are you calling this person your mother when you've got a different mother as well? How many mothers do you have? Oh, I've got 16. And you'd be like, what? Again, this needs explaining. I uh, see so a piqued your interest here because yeah. that's a kinship system. And, there's, and, and what makes it even more difficult is that it's not just like Aboriginal people are all just one mob of people. You've got different kinship systems all around the place with different laws and different ways of... I, you know, um, yeah. looking at things, so it's it's always different. Yeah. So that could be one of the subjects within a cultural awareness because some people will won't understand yeah. why it is that I'm calling this person my brother or my sister mm. or my cousin or my uncle. You know. Yeah. So you might find that, for example, that you know, if you had a I don't know, if you had a neighbour who was um, Aboriginal family there, and if you got had you know started a good relationship with them, you know, their kids they might start calling you uncle. You know, but again, you're not their uncle, but the mm. the same value applies um, to how they will yeah. treat their biological uncle to how you are, being yeah. that you've created that relationship. And growing up, I yeah. had about the two or three ladies who were referred to as auntie so and so, but they weren't. They referred to you as auntie? No, I no, I referred to them. Oh, as okay, auntie, okay, okay. But they weren't. Uh huh. They're just really good friends of my mother. Mm-hmm. To make it more confusing as well is, 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 you know, within some kinship systems, it can be that you would be a grandmother. Right. Right. But we're going to have to do a whole other podcast for that. Because <laughs> I'm just going to lay that out there. I'm going to yeah. plant that little seed now because that's just an idea. Because a lot of people go, what? So that's kinship. It's a kinship system. So yeah. um, that would be something that could be covered within a cultural awareness yeah. course or presentation or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So then... Now I'm intrigued in terms of this cultural application. Mm. What's the sort of things you want to cover there? I, at this point, Suzanne's very interesting because she likes to see what it is that the market wants yes. and what the market, uh, what it is that um, people are asking for, and the com- and then she sort of works downwards. To, then she'll design the program yeah. around that. Now because her and I are sort of fifty fifty on this. Um, she's putting in a lot of her knowledge and understanding um, into this program. We're looking at three days. We're looking at three half days at this point. Um, and within these days, the first day I would love to do on country. Mm. So I would like to take whoever our clients are out of their office and workspace and put them on Buja. And Buja is the Noongar word for land or country. And take them away from, because again, I want to expose them to a different culture, being world culture, being out there in mm. mother nature. And this kind of, it's, it's, it's just um, a way to set the scene. But I think what we're looking at for the first day is even though that we're providing the space and the forum mm. of a traditional culture outside and out in country... When I, we're looking at potentially not talking about anything necessarily Aboriginal related on day one, but what we are looking at doing on day one is defining what it, it what culture is, what culture is, yeah. because 
again, everybody's kind of got different ideas of yeah. what culture is. There's no point some, diving into culture if you haven't framed it. Some people don't. Some people don't think that they are in a culture. Some people don't think that mm. um, it doesn't exist, or like it only exists for other people that aren't like minorities or whatever. You know, yeah. so to define culture, I think is really important, and to do it in a, like out on country and away from mm. everything, I think could be very effective. Mm. And once we sort of set the understanding, and there'll be, you know, again, there'll be sort of different activities and things and, and, and um, of, of what culture is and talks. And another activity that I'd really like to run um, is called Bujani, right? So Buja again being country or land. And Ni is the Noongar word for listening, okay? Yeah. And, I, and I've, I've done this um, with um, Professor Simon Forrest, who's um, the Aboriginal um, liaison person at the... Curtin University, and uh, he take, take, uh, took us out in country and, and introduced this concept to me um, a few years back where, and at first you kind of think, what, what, you, what is this? This doesn't seem like interesting. But all it was is that just go out into, find a spot in nature and nih, listen, right? And don't do anything. It's sort of, I guess you could call it a, a, a meditation maybe, mm. But once you're out there for 30 minutes, you start to you, you start to tune in. You start to relax a little bit. Again, this could just be a, a meditational thing, you know. Mm. I think that might be very beneficial. Something like that. So uh, specific activities yeah. like that around day one, day two and three are still, I suppose, being the the specifics are still being designed. Um, the, the the technical aspects of what are, what's within those days of design. But we were looking at sort of three key themes and the first key, so really the first day will be a cultural awareness. The second day was would be the cultural approach. So we were going to talk about approaches and approaches being like um, what methods of communication do Aboriginal people use mm. and why, why can that be re- relevant to you? Again, I want to avoid just an information dump on people. I want to, It needs to be relevant to them. Yes. It needs to be relevant to their organisation. It needs to be synchronised with their RAP plans, their Reconciliation Action Plans. I think it's very important as well because that's the plans that they have you know, in action. Um, so an approach, the approach theme will be around language and communication and also about history. I actually really, I, 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 I try to tend to avoid history. Yes. And the reason why I do that is because it doesn't. I don't really like. Um, I don't really. I don't really like Aboriginal history, or I don't really like the historical aspect. Let me rephrase that a little bit. I don't like explaining colonism, colonization. I don't like explaining massacres. I don't. It is important, and there will be a small element of yeah. understanding this aspect, but I don't. I, I'm very much more interested in the positive aspects of mm. communication, Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal history, the unity between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people. So there'll be a little bit about history and there'll be a little bit about how that affects approaches now, Aboriginal approaches and yep. your approaches and your organisation, whatever. And then the final day will be the theme of the... So it's really three A's. It's a, it's a, um, awareness approach. And then the final day will be authenticity. Mm. This is probably the day that needs to be designed the most at this point because I've got an idea of what I want it to look like. But the, uh, but the outcome is that how can this information... How can you turn this information into something authentic? Something that can be... that can create positive impact within culture, all culture, mm. not just Aboriginal culture, not just Australian culture, personal culture, people culture. I like yeah. that. And you can learn a lot about that from Aboriginal people. In what way? They've been doing that for 60,000 yeah. years, understanding an, a harmonious way of living and being, being with family, being with community, being on country, caring for country, land, community, people. Yeah. It's a cycle that works. It's a cycle that has worked and continues to work in a traditional sense. Yes. All we have to do is figure out how can we take these traditional traditional values mm. and how can we synchronize it 
in the age where you and I can sit across from each other with this microphone, with the internet, uh, you know, from it's, it's such a hectic, crazy age at the moment in such a modern sense. Mm. What can we take from that traditional... And I don't have all the answers, and I don't no. claim to have all the answers. But no. what I do have is a little bit of experience, a really good um, business partner who I can work with, and um, at least a small understanding, a uh, perspective mm. of how I think that this information and knowledge can be utilized in a really effective way. Mm. Boom. And who's the target market for it? Mm, that's more of a Suzanne question. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is where she comes in. This is what she's... Yeah brilliant at um she originally like automatically i sort of go to i would like to get schools involved and i would like to get um you know teachers involved and mm. in, 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 in universities and all that kind of thing because that's what i know because that's yeah. my experience and that's who i've been um but suzanne is a lot better at understanding you know who needs it more and yeah. and and how that can convert to um real change so in, in the short sense, um, you know, anybody who's looking for it is, I would love to work with anybody yeah. who's interested in it, anybody, but not, but they have to be authentically interested in it. And what I mean yeah. by this is that if there are people or organizations that say, we want you because it is a requirement on our wrap plan, of course I will work with you, Yes. but we will then need to backtrack and I'll need, to, we'll need to find out if if it's actually authentic to you because mm. I don't want to just meet targets. Correct. I would like people to, cause that's my concern. Yes. With stuff like this. yes. Like, okay, we'll sheet dip a load of people through this. Yeah. Yeah. And then they'll we'll all tick be, that box. They'll all be good. We'll tick that box. We've done it now. Yeah. And it's, it's a step, it's a step yeah. in the right direction maybe, but if you don't, and this, and, I, and this is especially with things like an, uh, an acknowledgement to country. I find this happens quite a lot. It's becoming this tick the box kind of thing. We have to be respectful. Um, it's becoming a thing. Um, let's just, we need somebody to do an acknowledgement to, or welcome to country. Yeah. So let's go out and find somebody. And now we've ticked that box. Again, a great first step. But do you even understand what it's supposed to represent? Do you even understand what an acknowledgement of country really is mm. because if it's just a tick the box and that's all it's ever going to be well in whoever's organization or whoever's school or whatever then that's what it's going to be but i would like to think and i know there is there's a lot of people out there that like yourself are just genuinely interested and want yeah. to know and those are the people that i'm prioritizing because i like that because then i can work with you a lot easier because yeah. you at least understand that we're, we're coming on the same page then you know? yeah 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 um so I have a sort of question in it and it would help answer well there's two questions but I think they both be answered mm. at the same time one my first one from a business point of view oh. well just my consultant point of view is what would the what sort of benefits would I get from going on this but then there's another part of it which is a question that I had already written down which were if you take sort of the the, the three major games of life which are health wealth and relationships Ooh. what are some of the things that you see that we're <clears throat> overlooking missing in, in let's say modern culture mm. that you see in traditional aboriginal culture mm. which you can bring in <clears throat> to just generally make life better mm. you know in those three sort of areas does that make sense <laughs> wealth, health, and what are these three? Wealth, health, and relationships. Yeah, they're the three okay. main games that we all play. We all, you know, we we are with the people around us that we relate to. Yeah, is our health that we look after. Wealth, health, and relationships. And then, um, yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. Okay, so your question being, what can we utilize from a traditional Aboriginal yeah. culture that we synchronizes with yeah. health? In yeah. To a modern set. Yeah, him inputs into those that, you know, add to, Ooh. fill gaps. Because these would be sort of the, the things, the sort of benefits that you yeah. not expect. but That's a good way to frame it. it. Potentially get out of going on your cultural application. Okay. Or, There's probably, this is, these are, this, yeah. you frame this question in a way which my mind goes to like a hundred thousand different ways. Yeah. And I don't really know how to <laughs> articulate an answer. So I'm going to give just my impulsive instinct. Out. Let's go with health. Yeah. Okay. Health is an interesting one because it seems that most it seems that most people are 
health, especially in a in a modern sense, is yeah. it's pretty chaotic, right? I like the idea of looking at Aboriginal peoples, looking at a, a more holistic and traditional way of eating and consuming foods, and um, without all this, you know, cornstarch and, and and added fats and saturated sugars and Again, this is kind of where you can go on to that, I believe, you know, they call it that keto, that ketogenic diet, Mm. you know, and I think this kind of helps with a lot of people. And the idea being that our bodies are simply just not designed, and a lot of people know this, but a lot of people don't know this. Yes. Our bodies are not really designed to process most of what we eat and consume today. Mm. So when you look at a traditional Aboriginal, now when I use this word Aboriginal here, again, I'm not necessarily talking just about Australian Aboriginal people. I'm talking about your Abri- your great great ancestors. I'm talking yeah. about the I'm talking about any Aboriginal people, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago that were A they had to understand the cycle of what it is that they're eating in terms of what grows on what seasons and what to harvest when yes. and what to hunt when and how to hunt it and how to keep that sustainable. Again, this is People are very good at this. We we we're able to understand cycles and understand what to eat and what to put in our bodies and how to cook things. And mm. it's just become re- very skewed today. So I like yeah. the idea in terms of the, the theme of health, where you can look at really any Aboriginal, just research any Aboriginal diet or traditional Aboriginal um, uh, method of, of of agriculture or harvest. You know, eating yeah. food. It's very. I'm not saying I'm not saying you have to return to that because. Uh, but I'm saying that if you just look at it and understand that this is how our bodies have been designed and evolved over, you know, millions of years, mm. then you, I guess you'd start to understand that, you know, having that donut might not just be the, the, the greatest thing right now. Yeah. So that, that could be a health thing. Yeah. A wealth thing. Yeah. Wealth. Wealth. What's interesting... Okay, this one's interesting, right? Because with Aboriginal people, traditionally, wealth was, first of all, the concept of ownership didn't exist, yeah. right? Nobody owned anything, and this didn't just ex- this didn't just extend to this extended to family dynamics and relationships. For example, if I was to make a tool for you, no, not for you. If I was to make a tool, that tool was to serve a purpose for the community. It wasn't my tool. It may be a tool that I would wield most because I was that hunter or I was that yeah. person, but it wasn't a tool that I. The, the, the concept of it being mine didn't exist, right? Yeah. This also goes into family dynamics. Let's say that a mother was to have a child, and mm-hmm. that baby could potentially be breastfed by multiple women because those mothers, and this is where I go back to that kinship thing, you can maybe see how they got different, they got yeah, yeah, yeah. different values of that word mother. That, that child will be, it's not, ne- yes, of course, I have a biological relationship with that child and that is my child that came out of my body however i don't own that child you know there's a lot of parents that are like yeah this is my child my child yeah okay of course but again different perspectives so and, and they reflect this through their language as well so for example you know i was saying that that word that nunga word for land is buja well when a nunga, when a when a woman is pregnant pregnant the the word for that is bujari right because the idea here is that the value of a woman giving birth to the child equals the same value as the land giving birth to the child, buja, that re- represented right, through yes. that word, buja, just to give you an example. So mm. with wealth, it's, diff- it's an interesting one because we live in a time now where this is your microphone and this is your house and you have invited me into your space and I am in Bryn's world right now on his podcast and this is yours and I'll go back to my house and then I'll have my, you know, uh, I'll, I'll eat eat my lunch and you know it's it's there's yeah. mine and there's yours and there's ours and this sort of sparked around i believe it was kind of like the agricultural revolution in a lot of mm-hmm. cases because then because before that again this is not just an australian aboriginal thing this was a world thing this is what everybody thought mm. prior to like agriculture was that we're all in a community and we all kind of have to share a little bit you know mm. but it was only kind of when you started to grow things and then it's like hey hang on a minute you know m- me and my little family here we've grown x amount more of grain than that family over there. Therefore, are we entitled more to it? That's kind of the, the research I've done a little bit yeah. about this. So the answer to this is I have no 
I I've, I've got really no yeah. clue. It's not like we can just revert to like, oh, hey, everybody, we're going, let's, we're just all sharing everything now. Yeah. Forever now. No, no. Well, there's ownership now. So there's, there was, there was the concept of no ownership and now, now there is the concept of ownership. What's the answer to the wealth? I don't have the answers and yeah. I don't really know, but it is an interesting ride. It is. What was the last it is one? Very interesting. Relationships. Yeah. My God. That's like probably yeah, well, the most difficult one. Yeah. Because how many different levels of relationships and yeah. we, we can have relationships with people that we don't even know that we could just meet online today and meet them over in Iceland and create some relationship with them then. What I do know, however, which is inherent between all people, is that there seems that we are social beings, mm. highly, highly, highly social. And what I think works very, very, very well is when we get people together and communicate and converse in person. Of course, you can go to that whole debate with social media and, you know, um, you know is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? And yeah, okay, you can have split hairs on that too it has its place yeah. it has its place but I think in terms of relationship core relationships if you get people together which is why I want to take people out on country on day yeah. one because that's 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 to the relationship between people that you can sit in front of a person have a conversation and really connect one on one with that person or within that group you know because that's what we've been doing forever mm. what we haven't been doing forever is webcamming somebody on Iceland yeah. It's interesting, it's new, and it's great that we can do that, but it's not our traditional method of doing yeah. that. I mean, so. look, I've done two yeah. podcasts through Zoom. Oh, yeah. Um, and all the rest have been like this, where we sit and talk. Oh, yeah, cool. And, um, it's much better this way, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't enjoy them. And that's Zoom why, th yeah, the Zoom ones. Yeah. That's why I've only done two of them over 80-odd yeah. episodes. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Because there's something magical about creating the space. Yeah. And then having the conversation. Exactly. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. And that's beyond me. I just know that there is there is a um, there is a, something important about being in the same vicinity, looking in somebody and mm. conversing with somebody. It helps. Yeah. You know? And this would be what has happened for years and years and years. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it's important stuff. I think it's I think it's interesting stuff. I always mm. learn, I'm constantly learning, I, so I don't mm. The, the more and most of the time when I present or when I um, get up in front of people and I talk, I, my disclaimer is usually like, "Look, if there's any, if there's any, especially with Aboriginal people, I say like, if there's any Aboriginal people in this room that want to add to this or know something that I don't, let me know because I, I don't claim to have, I don't You're really know, <laughs> you know, because I'll, I'll hear different stories, I'll, I'll hear different stories from people." And they're just completely like opposite to each other. And then I'm like, wait, how do I, how which, do I which one that? is the right one? You know? But I yeah. guess that's all humans, right? It's just like you it hear is. stories and you know, you probably... hear say. And, you know. there's, there's one other thing that strikes me is um, that if you try and pin, because, because like you said, you know, lots of different clans, lots of different languages. Yeah. Um, if you try and pin it down, like, um, I say, you know, this is France. This is what French people are like, da, yeah. da, 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 da. and they speak this language of French. Da, 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 da. If you try and pin it down when you come to understand Aboriginal culture, that's not actually going to be your friend. Is that right? Because it seems, like you said, there's so many different, so many different stories, so many yeah. different perspectives. You know, things probably on the surface seem more uh, entwined loose less like black and white etc yeah so part of the understanding is just letting go and just yeah seeing does that make sense well yeah i guess that's so if what try, if you try and turn up in a, like a very black and white type yeah it's this or it's like that people are very um, so like ugh, they, they call it like tribalism right so everybody's got their tribes you yeah. know everybody's got I'm, I'm, I'm this team you know like I'm yeah. a, I'm an eagle supporter yeah. are you a Frio supporter you live in a Frio like you're my yeah. enemy now or like you know I've got whatever view of you know so and then it's like no okay well I'm a, I'm a man and you're a woman or whatever it yeah. is you know so everybody's got this like you know you could do like one of them like Venn diagrams like an infinite amount of <laughs> overlapping yeah. like yeah I'm cool with this person because he's an eagle supporter and, and he's the same age as me and 
um, or whatever. He's the same race as me, or whatever. You know, so they all they're all these different people that, uh, seem to be very good at categorizing their own selves into their own little communities, and it's a good thing because again, it's how we survive and it's how we um, understand the world around us. But I'm very interested in what happens when we we, we take away those lines a little bit, and yeah. like, oh, what it what happens if I don't? What happens if you're not just that Frio supporter, and I'm not just that Eagle supporter? Well, then we got a lot more lines. Well, yeah, now I'm a dude and you're a dude and we're the same age or whatever it is. Yeah. But what happens if I take away the age aspect? Okay, well, what happens if I now take away that layer of, 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 of that, the gender aspect? What happens if I take away... And then what I find, then what I think that we find is that we all seem a lot more similar than we think. Yes. A lot more similar than we yes. think. If not indistinguishably similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, but it's... We sort of at the core want the same things. Yeah. Just express them slightly differently. Yeah. Pretty much. Mm. Yeah. So that's my whole thing. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. I really don't know that much. I'm just, <laughs> I, just, I, just know, I just know a lot of what other people have told me and I just can just sometimes articulate it in a way that can potentially get me work. <laughs> <laughs> um, earlier on, you mentioned that, um, certainly from people outside of Australia, when yeah. you mentioned Aboriginal, they think, oh, yeah the dot painting yeah. and the walking across the land Aborigines and the, yeah and yeah. the walk and this and you know hold spit yeah. does that still happen of course it happens yeah yeah of course it happens because part of my part of my curiosity as well is you know we we in our very sort of modern culture you know on the hamster wheel all day yeah you know Monday to Friday you're going out you're doing this you're going to work go to work up shower go to sleep yeah, yeah, yeah all that sort of stuff is there, yeah, I guess, is there still that more, oh, it's difficult to describe, but I'm going to do air uh, thingy, what's it, bunny ears, yeah. that more what we would perceive traditional way of living still going on that's almost watching us go get up, go to work, da 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 yeah. da 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 yeah. 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 So, yeah, it is. So, to answer that question, it's like, uh, that... If okay, again, la- layers sense? of layers of culture. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. So it's like, yes, there are still Aboriginal people that live the old ways, right? Not very many, and I'm talking like the. But again, because because cultures always clash and there's always influence. Yeah, it's like, at what level of old ways do we, do we define it? Yeah. Right. It's like, so again, it's hard to just say. When it's even hard for me to say like oh, traditional Aboriginal culture with X, because there's just elements of it everywhere. So for example, it could be like yeah, there, there could be you know, go to Arnhem Land and that and that mob there, you know they will still be very traditional in their ways and they would speak their language and you know they'd, they'd paint themselves up and they'd have their corroborees and they'd have their um, whatever it is. But it's like again, there um, <laughs> people might ask uh, you know. It would be like you know they wouldn't necessarily be using a spear to go hunting because I'd be they got rifles now you know yeah, so yeah. It, it's it's always um, updated and changing and culture is always updating and changing and and but I like the idea of what is the core values and the, yeah. the core things that keep people together for so so long they keep going <clears throat> so yeah it's, I guess that's kind of what I was yeah and then you got and this is what we also called and within Aboriginal people call this walking both worlds okay so this is another mm. um, theme that I, I like to put in my um, design in my training or whatever it is, is that is the, the concept of both worlds and both worlds being that there's an Aboriginal way of doing things and there's a non-Aboriginal way of doing things. And Aboriginal people, most of the time, for 95, 90 to 99% of Aboriginal people have to play the game of walking in both worlds, meaning they've yeah. got to live Aboriginal way and they've got the Aboriginal ties and the Aboriginal... Because mm-hmm. fa- some, some cultures are simply... Some, some aspects of cultures may not... Or just are not compatible. As I mentioned before, it's like that ownership thing. Yeah. Either you either have the understanding of owning something or not. So that way, that the, the Aboriginal world there might be like sharing and not owning things, but at the same time, there'll be the other world, which is why, what I say walking in both worlds... Where it's like that could be the ownership mm. aspect or whatever it is. So Aboriginal people usually have to walk both worlds. Yeah, Which and is it's, a nice it's a, though, and it is a great it? Venn diagram too because yeah. they do overlap. And I like to put my I like to think that I'm sort of walking right in that middle, you know, because yeah. it's a it's a it's a good healthy space right in that middle. Yeah. Um, but you know, 
what I like to do now is I like to invite non-Aboriginal people into that middle. That's how, that's, that's yeah. the point. That's what's like, hey, check out this little world over here, you know? Yeah. Come walk, come walk in both worlds too, you know? Cause we, cause Aboriginal people walk in both, both worlds all the time. Yeah. You come work, come walk in both come worlds too. Vendor. Yeah. You're on your world and your world's cool. You know, you got the internet in your world. That's cool. But why don't you come out where there's no internet? Why don't you come out on Buja here? Cause she'll teach you something, something interesting too, you know, yeah. whatever it is. So yeah, there's definitely traditional, still traditional, you know, ways of, of, um, what, what, what you might think if you were living overseas and thinking of that word Aborigine, you know, like didgeridoo out there. But again, that becomes real kind of tokenistic, but in reality, it's the, a lot of what you see is still very important and very valued within the community and corroboree mm. and communication and relationships, all that kind of thing, you know? But yeah. Yeah. That, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Because I, I don't know if I've gone off on rants or what. No, no, no. It was a, diffi- it was a difficult question. E- even when I wrote it down beforehand, I was like, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to answer this. Yeah. I asked this question. It was almost like I wrote just a few words to try and, oh, hopefully the, the, the conversation before will help give me some momentum into that question. <laughs> so there you go. And what have you learned about yourself through doing the work that you do? Uh, probably not much. <laughs> I don't know. What have I learned about myself? That's a good question too. What have I learned about myself? I learned about myself. I learned that um, what I think I know, the more I learn, the less I know. Yeah. And this is virtually any subject I find that I'm learning. It's like it's, we live in the age of information where it's like the more hmm. I think, okay, so it's like I think that I can research this subject. I can research culture and I my idea, my preconceived idea of what culture is. I can go, oh, yeah, I think I can nail that. And then you look into it and you go, oh, this is... Hmm. There's a lot more to this, which makes it equally exciting and at the same time extremely um, frustrating. Because <laughs> it's it's um, so. What have I learned about myself? Um, I learned. I think I feel that I am at least resilient in the fact that I can absorb information and not claim to be a master at understanding it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm not really, I I don't really self-reflect. I just kind of uh, do things and be places and I just kind of enjoy it. That's me. Mm. I don't know. There you go. Yeah. What does the next sort of three to five years look like for you? Um, Again, you're asking the wrong questions here. I I don't know. I don't know. But I like not knowing. I like not knowing. I would like to say that within the next year that cultural curiosity will be something that is ready and... Um, that is something that will be that people to make an impact mm. to make an impact so in the next year to make an impact by sharing cultural knowledge and understanding to people that is one of my goals that I understand mm. and I acknowledge and also to but the next three to five years uh, yeah I don't know I don't know Brent and I don't really I don't mind not knowing. <laughs> That's fair enough. But I can be assured that it will still be something I enjoy doing. That is where I'll be in five years. It yeah. will still be in some place. And it will most likely be within Aboriginal education. Yeah. In some in some form or another. Yeah. Yeah. What would be the sort of ideal impact that you'd like to be able to have with your work? Mm, is it what would be the idea? bringing some of those people into the middle of that Venn diagram? Yeah, I just like look. I just like yeah that that to put to give people an understanding of the people around them mm. that I think can that I think are very important, and so that people can just kind of experience culture in a new way. Mm. to go oh and to adopt it as their own that's important as well to go yeah. look so it's not just some sort of mental this isn't just their their culture yeah this is a way of life and a way of being that mm. can be utilized in a lot of good ways in my everyday fast-paced modern life i think that's important i think mm. people need to slow down just a little bit and take a look around but um you know, again, that's not my final answer to that. I, it could be, there might be, I might wake up tomorrow and be like, oh, you know what? This is what my impact, I want my impact yeah, to yeah, be. Yeah. 
I just know that I like doing it and I know that it is important and therefore I'm happy to share it. That's good enough. See what I'm saying? Yeah, that's the, that's the goal. But yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. What do you, um, what sort of things do you do to keep yourself grounded? Oh man. I play a lot of computer games, so I shut off. Yeah. <laughs> I do shut off from from society. Uh, no, nah, but I I don't know. I like to what I do to ground myself. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a very big media fan. I do I do really like a good story, and mm. I do attribute this to Aboriginal people as well. Yes, is the brilliance in storytelling, and I love to sit down and watch a good television show, and I like to, I like to. To if anybody can portray a good story to me, then you've got me. Okay, yes. I like so to ground myself. I like to switch off from everything, and I say I say switch off, but then it's like it's kind of it's kind of um, the antithesis of because you, you're just sitting there, then you're consuming the media, right? But yeah. I, it's not. Um, I do this because I enjoy media. I enjoy stories. Mm. I enjoy people that can portray a good um, a plot you know, and characters and introduce things to me. I like that. So that's yeah. sort of how I, that's how I relax, you know? And I'm trying to articulate this in a lot better way than just saying, I like to watch TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do like a very good, I do like good storytelling and I do like to, mm. um, I don't know, I just relax. A selective consumer. Yeah, but you know what? I also make sure that I, everything's moderation. I have to live my life in moderation. That's very big for me in terms of, I right. will not, I will not spend, you know, four hours watching television unless I complement that with, like a hardcore gym sesh. Okay. Yeah. I need to be active when I'm, I need to balance the inactivity with activeness and vice versa or whatever. Mm. So I make sure that moderation is key and that's with eating. That's with, you know, exercising. Um, that's with watching television, sleeping, whatever it is. I try to keep everything a little bit balanced. Yeah. You know, balance is very important to me. Yeah. Why is that? Well, because I like, you know, I think it's, you know, if, you, if, if you're out of balance with anything, then, then it can just become a problem. And you can look at that in like a hundred different ways, you know. If, you, if you're eating too much of this, then, well, that's, mm. that's a problem. You've eaten too much of this. I think too much of anything is bad for you. Anything. Too much of anything. If you had, if you were constantly, um, you know, in like a, what's like a good example? I don't know. If you're on ecstasy all the time. Yeah. You know, if you were just constantly, you know, that dopamine is absolutely rushing all the time, then you're going to crash. It's going to, it needs yeah. to be balanced. It needs to be level. And, um, it's also like, you know, that's why I don't, that's why I like to make mistakes mm. because, or I like failure because if everybody was successful all the time at everything they ever did, then there's no, okay, then okay, then okay. But I like the idea that it's balanced, that it's, you need to have a bad experience mm. to make the good experience relevant. Yeah. So embrace the bad experiences a little bit, you know? Mm. So that's why, that's why balance is important to me. Mm. Suzanne will disagree with me on that a little bit because, uh, uh, but we, 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 that's, that's a little, that's a little footnote in there for her because, um, we, we have this conversation about balance, but, um, that's why it's important to me. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, I think yeah, moderation is pretty pretty key in mm. most of the, most of the way that I operate. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And one last question I always ask most of my guests to finish off with: yeah. if you could take one little nugget of information and just stick it into the collective conscious, oh. so everybody gets it. Oh, I should have, I should have saw this one coming. Okay, no, because now I have to think about it. <laughs> yes, if I can take one piece of, uh, if yeah. I can take one nug nugget of information, upload it into the collective consciousness. Everyone just gets it. Oh, oh. When you sit around and you just go, oh, why don't people do this? Is one, this is one of those things that I'm going to say and then I'm going to think of it later and I'm going to be like, you're I shouldn't have said it that way. I should have. Yeah, oh, so I don't. Okay. Oh, okay. What would be the one thing? What would be that one well, thing? Tell that, me now and if you end up with one later, yeah, just, record it on your record <laughs> it on the voice recorder. Edit it back on and there. I'll, I'll add it to the end. Edit it back on there. If you do. Oh, okay. I'm going to sound. I don't know if it's just because I'm. In Fremantle right now, I'm getting those. I'm getting that vibe right now, and it's gonna be it's gonna be real hippie of me to say this, but I do I do think that cliche aside, this does this is very important, mm -hmm. and I think that really it, just to be in the now, okay, just to be. It, of course, you should have your goals and you should have your 
what you want to do and where you want to mm. be. But I think right now is the most important. And this is another thing that Aboriginal people teach as well about being in the now is to savor it and, and respect everything around you right now in the mm. moment. I think that's the most important because it could, we could be anywhere tomorrow. This could go any which way. But what is important is right now. So thank you for having me on. Because <laughs> I really find, enjoy it. If people want to find you, Reese, where can they find you? Um, they get in touch with you. Yeah. Um, I am in the process of creating a website. Right. And I don't... Websites are very interesting. They're new to me because I don't do websites. Yeah. But what I do do is social media because I'm, you know... So where can they find you? So... You can just get my Instagram is Reese Paddock or my Facebook is Reese Paddock or my LinkedIn is Reese Paddock. So if you just type in Reese Paddock <laughs> into most good. social media, I will be there Indeed. and I'm happy to have conversations with anybody because that's what I do. Indeed. Yeah. Reese, thank Paddock. you very much for your time Thanks, today. Man. It's All been right. fun. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>